This is Star Talk Sports Edition. And for this installment, we're going to talk about the physics of baseball. Physics of baseball. You probably don't often see those two words in the same place. Now, I know a little bit about physics, but I don't know as much about the physics of baseball as my good friend, Bill Nye. Special guest today, Bill. Dude. Uh, Neil, Welcome greetings. Welcome to Star Talk Sports Edition. And I got my uh, co-host, Gary O'Reilly. Gary? Hi, Neil. Not that you're chopped liver. Sorry, I had to introduce Bill first. No, no, no. Bill takes priority. <laughs> I'm, I'm good with that. Uh, and where did you send Chuck today? Did you banish him somewhere? No, we haven't banished Chuck. Chuck has uh, found gainful employment. Oh, wow. Okay. He's got a job. He's on okay. a Instead of being he's a here comedian, he's got to tell jokes when he can. Doing his thing, man, and good luck to him. Especially during COVID. Well, yeah. Bill, not many people know that you, we may know you're a fan of baseball, but you've actually like studied it on almost a sabermetric level. And so- we, Oh, not, not sabermetric. Oh, well, almost. I know what you our mean. conversations, yeah. it's kind of smelled that way. And so yeah. I didn't want to do this show without your expertise- just lacing everything that Gary and I talk about. But then I realized, okay, to do this right, I mean, I played Little League, but we need somebody who's actually in the sport. And if we couldn't get an MLB person, let me get the next best thing. I got a, a college baseball coach who also happened to be my trainer, DJ Price. DJ, welcome to Star Talk. Hey, what's up, Neil? How you guys Dude, doing? Long welcome to back to Star Talk. This is not yeah, your first yeah, appearance. Yeah, it's my second time. Second, second time. time here. Yeah, so, look, he's fine. He's fine. So you're a coach. Where are you a coach right now? Uh, Barry University. I'm assistant coach there. Assistant coach. And, uh, in Florida, uh, North Miami. And they're Division Two. Division Two, yes. Division Two. Right. And you said like they – and where did they rank in that in recent years? Uh, I mean, last year before the, um, the COVID hit, they were, they were up in the, the top 15 in the country. And uh, 9-0, and they were undefeated. They were going through a pretty good time, and then everything hit. But uh, they were leading the country in most offensive categories, which is a, a big deal. Yeah, nice. yeah okay. A very, very cool. Well, glad to have you on this. We're going to tap you for – in case something – in case Bill says something that doesn't feel right, we're going to get your reaction to it, okay? It's not often I get an opportunity to override Bill Nye. <laughs> well, no, you're, 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 you're a street view of what, what Bill uh, Nye says because Bill, <laughs> Bill's going to ha hand us some science. And Bill, lately – I haven't caught up with you lately – um, you've got a new podcast, Science Rules. Great title. So what's the uh, what's the format it's of that? One of my oldest uh, turns of phrase, Science Rules. Uh, so the format is we have guests on and we talk about science. <laughs> we had Jennifer really? Dudna on just the other day. Wait, wait, wait. Right who's the before we? She wanted, you say we have guests. Uh, me and Corey, it is I, Corey S. Powell and I. Corey, and so he's your co-author on a couple of books. So yeah, you, so if you're you students of Corey S. Powell's, uh, he uh, helped me edit books that I've written. And uh, he's a very funny guy, and we co-host the podcast. And he also is one of the co-producers. He does the pre-interviews, finds people we argue about, discuss. So you just show up. We should have <laughs> Corey, that's what you're saying. Well... <laughs> I, I yes. mean, yeah, I guess. Yeah. That's the word you're looking for, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. And, for, and, and are you going on 20 years now as the CEO of the Planetary Society? 10 years, Neil. 10, 10 years. years. Okay. Tempest Fugit, but not quite that. Well, this is the fugitious. organization co-founded by Carl Sagan and, and two yep. others. So quite the mantle yeah, well, to be ascending to there. Yes. Well, Neil deGrasse Tyson was our chairman of the board for a while. No, I was never chair of the board. I was on the board. I was never chairman. You were on the board. And then he drifted off. He Wait, did it feel like I was chairman of the board? Was I making decisions I shouldn't have? <laughs> no, no, it was fine. But we miss you, Neil, because no, no, just keep when Neil's on the board, the, it was fun. I, I, oh, and now it's a chore? No, no, it's just, it's different kind of fun. So in this first segment, we're talking about baseball as a contact sport. And normally it is the last thing ever mentioned when people give the list of contact sports. But of course, as Bill is introducing here, ball hits bat, pitcher hits batter. <laughs> there's yeah. contact. Well, the other, the apparently the play worst. The plate, there's contact. The in worst contact in, in sports is the play at the plate, where one guy has almost no pads on. The other guy is trying to find the ball while this other human is hurtling toward him at 15 miles an hour or whatever the heck. Cleats and if you play catcher, people. Well, if, what, if you Dane play catch, which I used to Dane. do, yeah, yeah. Put your, be sure to have your left foot or whatever it is, your back foot 
parallel to the third baseline. So when the guy slides into your leg, you fold at the knee. And you don't bust up uh, your knee. Yeah. You don't go sideways across your knee. This I was is bigger than all people sliding into me. Details. So I never, they fell backwards. I. Well, <laughs> back in the day, they used to call the uh, catcher's equipment the tools of ignorance. So <laughs> they, I'm yeah. pretty sure they still do, DJ. <laughs> <laughs> wait, so let's start, wait, let's start organizationally here. So Bill, um, if, Someone is throwing a 100 mile an hour fastball because lately they've been clocking the speed, the exit speed, exit velocity of the ball, or at least the ball upon leaving the bat. And all the home runs seem to be 103, 106, 107 miles an hour. Is that all I need? If I just make sure the ball leaves my bat at that speed and, and at the right angle, am I basically getting a home run, no matter how big and bulky and strong I am? Yeah, but you just threw in offhandedly, oh, and at the right angle. Okay. Yeah, that's like, that's, <laughs> excuse me. Wow. That's like a thing. So everybody <laughs> in a, a non-apocryphal story from the story of Neil and Bill. One day, Neil's going musing, blah, 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 assuming a level swing. Okay, hold it. <laughs> there's two different things in hitting, DJ. There's hitting and there's hitting for power. Yes. So hitting, you're aiming the ball someplace, trying to get it around defenders, over the defender's head, down the line so the defender has to run towards you while you're running past him and things like that. But then hitting for power, you have to hit it at an angle that is going to take it up uh, over the fence. Yeah, but or, Bill, does that mean yeah. I don't have field. to be big and burly to do that? No. No, that's the mystery of, for example, from my uh, – Seattle fandom days, uh, Ichiro Suzuki, who went on to play, uh, they all do, uh, went on to play for the Yankees. But this is a pretty small well, guy who could hit this. home runs. Yeah. <laughs> I think, well, I think wait, wait, so DJ, to, oh, DJ, sorry. you're 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 a burly guy, right? You have girth, and so when I think of you holding a bat, I think this guy's powerful. I should back up. But then, like Bill is saying, you get Ichiro, you get Altuve. Um, mm -hmm. You get people who are little. Uh, Red Sox had a few little people who hit. Uh, who's the guy with the Red Sox? Mookie um, Betts, who's now on the Dodgers. No, but also been, also the second baseman, uh, uh, um, Dustin uh, Pedroia. Dustin Pedroia. Okay, yep. these guys can punch the ball, hit triples, hit doubles. I don't care if there's a if there's a, a, a green monster out there. So so Bill, is it just some kind of mythology that you need to be big, or do you just have to move the bat with precision and with speed? Well, that's all you have to do is move it with precision and speed. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We're yeah, done so here. <laughs> <laughs> in general, big guys can wait, guys who are stronger can wait a little longer to bring the bat around uh, and direct the ball. But if you're strong, you can muscle the bat around later in the pitch. That's not muscle, it's just speed. It's just reflexes. Well, okay, right? but the bat has mass. And so you're going to overcome its inertia okay. with strength. Okay. And I think it was Isaac Newton who said this. A lot of little guys actually have I mean, some incredible bat speed, yeah, which, which adds to that. You know, I mean, Altuve has is, is got some incredible bat speed. And, you know, with his size, you, you, you would think that most balls probably would be high to begin with. And, you know, because he's getting such good, uh, you know, good bat speed and a little bit of angle upwards, because uh, not to say that he's short, but he is a little shorter. He, it, given him the right ball, he can definitely send it a long way. So, right, wait, so Bill, it's how about this, this great subtle con thing? At the point I make contact with the ball, how important is my musculature? If I if, don't think it's that important. It's the mass of the bat. It's the mass of the bat that's going to. Uh, so the you're speed saying and mass if I use a lighter bat, but I can get high speeds. Well, this is the great controversy. So, yes. furthermore, also in addition to continue. What's happening is people are selecting thinner and thinner bat handles uh, so that uh, the bat has a springiness. If you were somehow allowed to play baseball with some magical tennis racket, some racket that could handle, I guess that's a pun, that could deal with uh, <laughs> accommodate more flex, accommodate. Uh, you could really launch the ball uh, much, much farther than is currently possible. Um, compare and contrast jumping up and down off a sidewalk with jumping up and down off a trampoline. 
So, so if a bit you could like get a hockey bat, stick, a bit like a hockey, an, an ice hockey stick, where it's yeah. got that, it's composite, but it's got that flexibility in there. Is that the sort of thing you're talking about? Yeah. So if you're allowed to do that, then so yeah. furthermore, also. But you're saying the spring these, would give it a little extra push. Yeah. Yeah. But so what happens then? The, another not for nothing effect is people are wearing batting gloves. And so they have a thickness. The pads on the gloves have a thickness. So then people are selecting even narrower bat handles and um, and uh, able to get more flex. Wait, wait is this why the bats are breaking? Because now... Then you get bats breaking. You look mm -hmm. at Babe Ruth's bat from back it's in the day. It's a tree trunk. Yeah, it's a hickory. <laughs> you know, well, it is. It's a so-called hickory stick. Desperate Dan. Um, and uh, you had to be quite strong Street to bring truck. that bat around. And yeah, they de definitely met, match the bats to the player now, too. You know, yeah. so they, what, they what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, you know, based on size, weight, um, you know, the, the what the what the, the bat speed of the individual is, you can kind of gauge what you what kind of bat they can handle before they break it or the ball breaks it and how they can get maximum amount of speed. They, they cut the tops out to give it a little bit less ounces, more ounces. Well, why not so just go all the way the, and, and, and cork them? Right. They, well, Corking <laughs> doesn't work. It, I, it, I, 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 I agree with that. It doesn't. I don't, no, it, no. It, it take uh, away some of the mass work. of the bat. Well, not well, just, here's the problem with corking. Our perception might be cork is springy. So if you put springy material in the bat, hmm. uh, then you would get some of that spring, some of that energy storing to the ball as it left the bat. But it doesn't work because... The ball is in contact for, with the bat for such a short amount of time, barely a thousandth of a second. The energy doesn't have time to get into the cork and back out. And plus, you lose a tremendous amount at the interface where the cork would touch the wood. So for people out there trying this, it doesn't work. And I remembered the corking back in the 70s. The, well, it's been going on since the 1800s. Really? Now. Okay. Well, okay. Then my in my my day. Okay. Mm -hmm. The one of the rationales was that you still have the sort of the bulk of the bat, but you made it lighter. Well, you can drill all the freaking holes in the bat you want, but then you weaken it, and it yeah. will shatter. And but then one. why why not just use a lighter bat? So uh, if you get it too light, then it fails. It breaks, and. Uh, uh, this is the great, you know, this is the magical thing about baseball, everybody. This is what everybody loves about it, is after a century and a half of dinking around, things are just dialed in where it just barely works. It just barely doesn't work. And it's a game of thousands of inches. And it's just every pitch is a statistic. It's a game for nerds. So <laughs> uh, uh, the thing about the bats that makes me a little crazy how about this rule, DJ? If your bat breaks, you're out. How about that? I, I would if you break I, your that bat. That's like a pretty out. good rule. I mean, it'd be interesting. Then, then that everybody's like an angry bat, parent, Bill. Well, <laughs> then everybody's. <laughs> you broke that record so toy. You got to go and sit on the yeah. body step. Well, yeah. and you know that's why we can't have nice things. <laughs> no, so <laughs> so hey, along this back, line. Bill. Um, you know, you I, talked about Altuve, and I'll sort of do the Aaron Judge comparison. For them, the strike zone is in a different place because one's five foot five, the other's six foot five. Seven, yeah. Seven, even. Um, huge. Does Altuve have an advantage because he can get his bat below a possible ball that's coming in? Books have been written, as I like to remark. <laughs> the answer is absolutely, without question, it depends. Good. <laughs> so the reason both of these guys are having success at the major league level is they have compensated for the large strike zone by being uh -huh. a huge guy who can bring the bat around really fast yeah. and for having a small strike zone by being a smaller guy who can bring the bat around really fast. And so... But it also uh, sounds like, Bill, that if you're small, then um, that shrinks the strike zone so then the pitcher has to be more accurate and you don't have to be able to swing in more places than the big guy. Except you can't reach as far as the big guy. 
Okay. So the pitcher then ah. has a, has a bigger strike yeah. zone, but mm-hmm. it's a so bigger the guy swinging yeah, a bigger away thing. and stuff like that. Yeah, and you know we're as we say we're getting into where the the gray areas where it depends. And I just want to go on and on about these kids today and the bats. Okay, <laughs> so on a baseball bat is a label, a brand. And skilled craftspeople in Kentucky making bats put the brand so that the uh, grain is oriented to strike the ball edge on. And so back when I was a Seattleite, lived there for 26 years, big Mariner fan, big Seahawks fan, I met with none other than Chuck Armstrong, who was president, not CEO, not owner, president of the Mariners organization, to give a little talk to these kids, these kids today, about branding a bat. So I had this very demonstration. So the grain of the bat is oriented that way. They put the label there so that you strike the ball edge on. If you hit the ball this way, the bat will flex and ultimately fail because the grains will be moving against each other. They'll be sliding in shear, as it's called. So can I show that to some of my college players? Absolutely. <laughs> for fun, but they don't know to teach it. <laughs> I, no, it's, it's, something, it's something I'm trying to explain to them for you. For, it's, for wait, could, it be it lost that, in could it be that they but, came out of high school with aluminum bats? And so they don't have yeah, to think about and this. So, oh, so the wait, reason we can't have explained for sure. So uh, Gary, <laughs> you made reference to parents getting arms akimbo about yes. these kids breaking their toys. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're a parent, uh, uh, fr- Breaking bats is expensive. You yeah. have to go buy bats. If you're uh, running a little league team or the next level up high school team and you're breaking bats, it's just like a, uh, it's too expensive. So that's why they, we, it went to aluminum bats. Now you can engineer an aluminum bat to have a tremendous amount of flex. Yeah. And uh, I played softball with a guy who got hit in the face with a ball that was just scream a third baseman because was just screaming because there was a few years of sort of lack of regulation in the springtivity, the springiness of the bats. Uh, and so... Well, he got hit in the face with a ball that was hit by an aluminum bat. A guy with an aluminum bat gotcha. playing softball. He wasn't hit in the face with aluminum bat. I just want to... Not the bat. That would be that. very troubling. So anyway, uh, that's why... All the way through college, people play with aluminum bats. Then if you're an outstanding player and you get an opportunity to play in the majors with a wooden bat, you're not familiar with this notion of branding the bat and taking into account the mechanical properties of the wood. DJ, what do your players use? Um, we use aluminum at the, uh, at the level. Um, yeah, but, sure. You know, most of them use wood during the summer. Um, you know, just so that the, the you know scouts and, and coaches can get an opportunity to see what they're capable of doing with an actual bat in, in a real um, situation. Yeah, okay. And but but have, even at that level, you, you're talking. To, I mean, it's dangerous. I mean, it's super dangerous. Uh, you why, know, I think I think all that, college ball should go to wood. To be honest with you, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, the why is it dangerous? Is? What's dangerous? Um, the, the the speed you can get off the bat or a pitch oh, ball. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. so the the pitcher has. Uh, I mean, think about it. There are pitchers in the major leagues that are getting hit in the head and, right. and the ball is coming a fractionally slower than it would be in college when they're using metal and they're all prospects to that level. So right. you, you got a guy that's equivalent to uh, an Aaron judge at six, 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 seven, that's two sixty, And he hits a ball with an aluminum bat at a pitcher that he's got no reaction time. There's no way that he's getting. So Bill, back that. to your original point if baseball has been, has become or has always been this game of inches and microseconds. And uh, and so the slightly better bat will kill the pitcher, right? Well, just that the pitcher stands that close has always been marvelous. Because when, when you see them catch a ball that is back to them, it's like, oh my gosh, any fraction of a second faster <laughs> or if they're slower, the ball faster, they slower, they lose their head. You got to wave at it, as they say. Yeah. So uh, anyway, aluminum bats can be tuned or engineered so that they don't have this crazy springiness. But then they get 
they get unesthetic, they get heavy, they get heavy in the wrong way. And so this is gets into the whole wooden bat controversy. By the way, Gary, I don't know your background, but there's a guy in cricket called the silly mid-off. Yes, it's a, it's so, a, it's a fielding position. Yeah. yeah, it's also, what are you doing? You're standing right in front of a guy with a yeah. wooden club and a ball's going 100 <laughs> miles an hour. The okay. clue's in the t- with the, no the clue is quite simply their silly position. Yeah, and yeah. so he doesn't wear gloves in cricket. They don't no. wear gloves. They haven't thought of that. Anyway, oh, no, we, so. thought about it. we thought about it and we just said no. <laughs> no, the only guy, the wicket keeper is allowed to do That's something. That's right. Anyway. And you are, the, a, a, a bowler in cricket can reach over 100 miles an hour because you are using the ground as yeah. another part well, of we'll get, the Well, we're going to get to that. In the next segment, right. we're going to talk about the making of a pitch. And I've had long conversations with Bill about this, and I still don't understand. He's going to have to make <laughs> you want to throw clear. in your legs <laughs> to, to Gary's to. point. So when we come back, Star Talk Sports Edition, the physics of baseball with Bill Nye. We're back, Star Talk Sports Edition, the physics of baseball. We've got Gary O'Reilly, Gary. Hey, Neil. Yeah, uh, we lost Chuck. He's he's on a gig. You, yep. you tell me, so that's good. We'll check yeah, check him out. For on him. The next, good for him. Check him out on the next round. Uh, I've got with me uh, my trainer, I guess former trainer, because he moved to Florida, DJ Price. DJ. What's up? I, I have you on, not, beca- not because you were my former trainer, but because I know you are baseball crazy man. And <laughs> you, and every day, all day. <laughs> every day you, ble- you bleed baseball, right? So. And just to have a ground truth on this conversation we're having with Bill Nye, who's sharing with us his sort of life's thinking and expertise on basically the physics <laughs> of baseball. And Bill, you and I have had conversations about what pitchers do when they throw the ball, right? They're not just throwing the ball. Some other kinematic, biophysiological thing is going on. So could you just lay this out for us, what's going on on the mound? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm an expert on that. No, everybody, uh, <laughs> Gary, Yes, you're of British descent, mm-hmm. and so you grew up playing cricket. Kind of, yes. Yeah. Well, and he's on here because he's a former <clears throat> professional soccer player. That's cr- I'm familiar with I have held a bat and had things thrown at me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in cricket... <laughs> Not necessarily cricket. at the same time. <laughs> at the same time, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go on, Bill, cr- sorry. No, it's all good. In cricket, they, uh, they, you all, allow the bowler, as he's called, to, uh, I presume there's some she bowlers, to bowlers, to bounce the ball off the ground. Yeah. Right? Although you can, you can bowl a full toss. So it, it gets to the wicket or the batsman without touching the ground. But generally, they incorporate the ground and this then adds another layer of physics to the whole affair. Oh. Well, here's the thing that happened. I'm sure early on, cricketeers discovered that the bowler could just overwhelm the batter, could just do anything to the batter. The batter, batsman could not um, routinely handle the bold ball. Yep. So they made a rule that the bowler has to keep his elbow straight. Okay. Oh, well, to reduce the range of damage just, they can commit. Yeah. Okay. That's another, okay, fine. But what the bowler can do is run, use his legs. And so there's an old saying, and DJ, let me just see if this is a true fact or what I whimsically call a false fact, ha, 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 that you throw with your legs. Uh, Agreed. So, yeah. So what you want to do, what you want to do in the, so to deal with this in U.S. baseball, originally U.S., in baseball, they uh, allowed you to push off a fixed object, which is traditionally called the pitching rubber. Also in the rules, it's called the pitcher's plate. You uh, push with your back leg while you throw, but you're allowed to bend your elbow. So it's the different rules uh, for throwing. But in all of this, the key to it is how you grip the ball or a key, a very important aspect of it, rather, is how you grip the ball. Relative to the stitches or how you grip the ball no matter what? Yeah, so with respect to the stitches, right. So uh, this is the four seam where you see all four seams. Mm -hmm. Then you can hold it here and you see two seams, one, two, one, two. 
or you hold it a little crooked and you get um, you get the curveball, you get the slider, and then people who spend hours and hours at this throw it with hardly any spin on it with the fork ball. And then it, it, when it's hardly any spin, the stitches catch the air in spectacular ways and make it fly funny. But what's the difference between a fork ball and a and a um, knuckle ball? Uh, you can grip the fork ball much more tightly. When you're trying to throw a knuckle ball, you can you're barely hanging on, mm -hmm. and so you just can't throw it as you can't snap your wrist with the same oomph. So that's a faster yeah. knuckle ball. All right, so it's Bill, a okay. much faster. So they hold it all these ways. The whole goal <laughs> is for the batter to not hit the ball, right? That's, yes. That's the entire goal. So you want to fool the batter, right? Yes. So you are using certain aerodynamic principles in your favor to help you fool the batter because the batter's brain sees it as just this, this, this object coming towards them that might do normal things that gravity would do to it. But you are now exploiting what the air could do confusing my Newtonian expectations for the ball. Is that a fair characterization? Uh, sure. I, I just, DJ, how many times as a coach have you mentioned, okay, listen, people, we want to confuse our Newtonian expectations. <laughs> right, I'm, I'm going to use that today. I mean, it's just, <laughs> a, it's an old baseball to, expression. Can you zoom me in for that one? Because yeah, I want to see how that goes down. I can't wait so, to see how everybody looks back at me. <laughs> so <laughs> what? That's something new. So, uh, <laughs> this is, these are pictures from one of my favorite books, An Album of Fluid Motion. And you talk about fun. Anything that, that was on the bestseller is, list recently, I saw. Yeah, sure it was. Yeah. Uh, anything that flows <laughs> is a fluid. So, here is a sphere and a fluid. The fluid's going by, it's uh, a ball in water. And you see these pulses poo, 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 poo. It's shedding vortices, just like a whistle. Oh, you can't whistle on Zoom. Uh, it's shedding pul -pul -pul pulses. But if we affix a trip wire, this little wire, then you see how much more smooth the flow downstream is. A trip wire to, to make texture to the surface. Yeah, and what it does, the way I describe it, is it causes molecules to tumble and when they tumble, they shear. They, they go past each other this way. And their uh, uh, interaction changes and they flow more smoothly. So then, in the ultimate amazing ultativity of great amazingness, whoa, 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 where is it? Here we go. Um, we put a baseball in a wind tunnel with streams of smoke. And you see where the stitches... The stitch has tripped the boundary layer. It sticks to the ball much more smoothly, where the stitch is downstream of the boundary layer of the, uh, of the free stream. It causes the tumble. So this interaction of smoothness versus tumbling uh, causes changes in pressure on each side of the ball, and it flies funny, and it's hard to hit. And pitchers and bowlers exploit this. They go crazy for this. Okay, we have to assume right. that the inventors of baseball didn't have fluid dynamics in mind at the time. They just tried to stitch a freaking ball together. So what <laughs> you're saying they is discovered, that oh, but they discovered the properties of this like that. Right. So but players. What, but what if Neil? Yeah. And I, I think we've had uh, Meredith Wills, who's a physicist herself, yes, yes, did yeah. a little bit of an investigation. And the thread they used in the stitches was uh, something like ten or so percent thicker. Yeah, she was she was accounting for the higher uh, baseball, the higher home run. That's uh, right. Rate. Yeah. Yes. So, Bill, what what's up with that? Yeah. So different leagues are allowed to use different stitches. Ooh. In general, the younger the players are, the higher the stitches. Which you mean the more raised the they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, just uh, it, it, maybe that's absolutely true. The younger the players, the higher the stitches, the thicker the thread, mm -hmm. which uh, enables the pitchers to learn to use the, to exploit this more readily. Then in the major league, the stitches get quite thin, and this demands more of the pitcher. He has to have more skill. 
And when I've hung out with these guys and DJ, you must know more, they just walk around the clubhouse all day, yep. snapping their fingers to get the strength so Absolutely. they can, uh, you know, um, and, and just and testing to see this. how the ball moves when they do it too. So, you know, mm -hmm. they can get different angles and, and, and uh, you know, they, they're trying new things all the time. Putting pressure on one finger will give you one effect. Putting pressure on another finger will give you another a completely opposite effect, just like that. But you're also talking about length of fingers, you know, like like Mariano Rivera, for example, had one finger that was longer. A Yankee, um, by the way. Yes. Yeah, he's a Yankee. Just, just and, he, and he he picked that up because – one day, um, one of his coaches was telling him just to, th you know, throw it with a little bit more pressure on another finger. And he was getting, he wasn't getting as much run. And then he told him, just throw it the way you want, you normally throw it. And then all of a sudden his ball started running because he wasn't putting the pressure on the finger that was longer. And he was just using so, it and it was staying on the ball longer and then creates the best pitch in baseball, the cut fastball. Wait, wait, wait. What, what do you mean he had a long finger? What, what, what like his you finger was abnormally longer than most. Wait, wait. So, you sound like he only has one finger. So please, well, which has, finger are you talking about? The, the fingers he puts on the ball. So he had two fingers on the ball. You see, my his one finger, his middle finger, may have been a little bit longer than most pitchers. Which so gives he gets him a, to stay in contact with the ball with the as ball it rolls longer. out of his hand longer and therefore give it a little extra push. Right. And he gets – and that's where he got his cut fastball from. And so, it was just by accident. Just DJ, asking. tell us about the cut fastball. Yeah. Yeah, what is so that? So that's a fastball, right? And that's a cut fastball. Is that right? Um, you no, just move I mean, over a little bit? It's a, it, it can be anywhere. That's the thing. It's relative to where, like, where you have release on the ball and pressure on the fall. So what we're doing is fastball is always over the top. All right. There's no, you're not tr trying to go to one side or the other side. You're trying to get over the top. But usually the fingers are close together. All right. And some guys throw it right down the middle where they have the, the, the small end of the, the horseshoe. Some guys put a little bit more curve on the, on the outside. Yeah. Some guys turn it so that it's um, yeah, that's it. Exactly. And they're just, all they're doing is throwing it, throwing it just like a fastball, but the ball would come off a little bit left or right. And so, it does. So DJ is, am I right in saying that that is considered possibly, probably, the most difficult thing or skill to execute in the world of sport? Based <laughs> on Mariano ball. Rivera, I would totally agree. <laughs> because he was, he was, he had oh, So he had that's what pitches. they call the cutter. That's what they call yes, the cutter. Yes, the cutter. He had two pitches. He had two pitches. He had a cutter and a fastball. And you, it was hard to dictate which one was coming because his release point was identical. So we always let go of the ball at a certain place. So that's where hitters are trying to get a little bit of a, an idea of where the ball is coming out based on release point, angles of the, the hand, what part of the hand you see. He always let go of his fastball like this. So he came over the top and off, but it depend on which pressure he had given more to that finger. And then the ball would run you're at the last gonna, minute. You're not going to read that from the plate, are you? No. You don't no. read it until it's too late. And that's why he <laughs> too, broke too a late. massive amount of bats. I mean, yeah, like so, you would watch him and he would be breaking bats left and right because you're seeing fastball in your brain. And normally with breaking pitches and change-ups and slower pitches, there's like a light that goes off, this emergency. Hey, that's not the same. Stay back, right? <laughs> yeah. So then you, 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 know, you, you fight it off, you do something different. But when his fastball was literally a mile per hour slower, or fa I mean, his cut fastball was a mile per hour slower, you're registering that too late. And all of a sudden, it's, it goes from the middle of the plate to your knuckles. And you're now like, all right, if I don't get my hands in now, I'm going to get hurt. Not, yeah. not even just like – Am I going to make contact? I'm my life is in danger. I have to do something to stop it from happening. And you know, guys were taking like crazy swings because they were just trying to fight it off. I mean, guys were going through bats, two, three bats in a bat, wow. you know, because of that fastball. And it, that's what made him so devastating because the ball was going. It was an identical pitch. It was identical release point, but the last second is where you get that little cut, that little break, and it's hard to register. If they're coming at the same speed. Well, wait, Bill, Bill, how, how can the ball do something different partway through the arc that it's taking? How's that even so, possible? Well, so. Uh, the, like the ball doesn't just stop. I mean, I, there was a Bugs Bunny where 
<laughs> with one pitcher. of the all-time sporting <laughs> legends. Yes. Where the pitcher amazing throws pitcher, amazing. like the slow ball, and the ball just kind of wiggles and, and jiggles and stops and continues. So that's, of course, a cartoon extreme mm-hmm. of this. But um, is, is, is DJ describing something, an impression of what the ball is doing rather than what the ball is actually doing? So uh, to give credit where credit is due, Robert Adair, the physics of baseball, physicist to the major leagues, uh, uh, talked about this being the same phenomenon observed by two different people. So your point of view is what's producing this. So as the ball is coming toward the plate, not only is it, uh, as soon as you let go of it, it's slowing down because of air. The air is slowing it down but it's also falling. And so if you can get it to slow down and fall in a different way by changing how fast it's going when it leaves your hand and changing where you aim it, it appears to the batter to be moving across the plate. But it's moving across the the whole, yeah, yeah, Yeah. sorry, Uh yeah, well said. Uh, And so it's always doing that, it's just changing the rate at which it's doing that. And you guys, when you start getting in the most difficult thing ever in sports, I mean, I, I don't know. I watch hockey players do what baseball <laughs> players do backwards and on ice skates. So I'm open-minded. <laughs> Not no, except, that, wait, 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 Bill. Most of the time the puck is on the ice. So that reduces one of the degrees of freedom of how and where you find it before you hit it. Whereas oh, a ball being most hit can move time. in all, all dimensions. Uh, Neil, it's the most of the time that makes it <laughs> really okay. difficult. Okay. No, modern players, modern hockey players lift the puck. Yeah, they, all they, they the lift time. the puck. Yeah. They totally but, but, lift the puck. But you're hitting a spherical object with a round bat. So as the saying goes, yes. and you're you're a soccer player, the ball is round. Mm-hmm. The ball but is round. I would round, use, the I would use the, a, a larger surface area, a flatter area, whether it's the side <laughs> of my foot, either outside or inside, or the instep. Yeah. which is a, it's uh, but, a larger surface area to make contact with the ball. But I mean, isn't it an old saying that the ball is round, anything can happen? Well, let me yeah. get to that. Just before we take a break, Bill, give me like your most succinct comment on, the, uh, on what, fraction of an in, what a fraction of an inch difference contact with the ball makes for, well, for the fate of the, the ball order, after it leaves the bat. It's on the order of a few sheets of paper. Really? Yeah. I mean, There'd be the thickness five of Five or six thousandths of an inch, yeah. So, you know, you can, if you're a human, and a lot of your uh, viewers are. Um, Most are, yeah. You can, Some. Yeah, you can, you can feel the difference between two thousandths and four thousandths without much difficulty. Mm-hmm. But that much difference uh, will make a tremendous difference in the flight of the ball. So it's an exaggeration to even say... A fraction of an inch. It's even like a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of an inch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the charm. But think about this, people. This is something wait, always wait, 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 amazes. Wait, wait, but that me. means the big sluggers, the successful home run hitters, can can decide in a fraction, a little fraction of a second, whether they're going to swing, swing a round stick, make contact with a round ball, and hit the ball four hundred and fifty feet. That's spooky. I've seen it. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> but weird. don't forget, Neil, you're adding history of their one to one confrontations into the mix, not just what's this guy dialing up in this moment. What has this guy dialed up to me in the past at certain se- certain moments in a match, in a game? So there's a whole lot. I mean, DJ, yeah, there's, a, me there's, a, there's a lot of educated, ed- yeah. edu- a lot of educated guessing. Um, you know, so that does come down to they have books on everybody. You know, mm-hmm. they, usually rookies have a, a, a good go the first couple times through because they, they don't no know what, yet. doesn't know what the ball looks like when it comes off. You know, when you start getting used to seeing somebody throw a ball, and that's why nowadays most starters don't make it through three rounds of, of nine. So they, uh-huh. they usually only go two, two and a half because by that time, that third time, I've seen him. I know what his pitch is. I know where he's throwing me. I know what he's trying. I know his plan. So, you know, like the good pitchers nowadays don't make it nine innings because of the fact that the hitters are actually, there's so much more, um, you know, math and they're coming in They're Trust me, I'm not, I'm not trying. I'm an athlete as well, but uh, they're not coming in going, I got it. And it's the fact that there are people down there actually giving them information, like books of it. 
Like, hey, you just, you know, last time he got you out on this, watch for this first pitch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I have, I'm looking curveball first pitch. I know curveball is coming. If it's in my hitting zone, I'm going to take the best swing possible and see how hard I can hit this thing. You know, and that, that's, that's so where you, you start taking. The pre- you preload the precision of what you're doing. Right. And of because course, they say even great home run hitters strike out more often than they hit a home run. So Right. Because of the bat angle that they're taking, but that's besides the point. I think a lot of the guys are, are, are striking out now because of the bat angles and how they're changing it. Um, you, you, you're, they're, they're, they're two, they're, their degrees of upward swing is changing how consistent people are hitting the ball. Um, so I, and I don't, I don't know why it doesn't make any sense. I mean, back when, when I was growing up in the eighties and nineties, it was, you know, 300 was the, the, was it, you wanted to bat 300. Now you got guys that are in the lineups batting 217 with 40 home runs and they're all right, well, he's, he's a home run and every kid wants to be him. But what about the guy that's batting 340, like a DJ LeMayhew, you know, that he hits the ball over the place, but then he hits a little dribble up the middle scores, two runs. And everybody's like, well, he could have hit it out, you know, but he didn't, mm-hmm. you know, like that. That's not baseball. I mean, a high average is is a player. When we yeah, come back more crazy. Star Talk Sports Edition, the physics of baseball with Bill Nye. We're back. Star Talk Sports Edition, the physics of baseball. Got my longtime friend, Bill Nye, who thinks if you didn't know this, this man thinks and breathes baseball. Uh, he's, he's a student of baseball, as you might say. And I also brought in someone from the trenches, DJ Price, a former trainer of mine who moved to Florida to coach baseball. In fact, he coached while he was here in New York. And so he knows some insides and outs. And each of you are here to keep each other honest about what you say (laughs) about the sport. (laughs) But I want to take this segment and start thinking about um, the air, the texture of the air, the humidity in the air, the air pressure. And how do these other factors, these climactic factors, influence either the pitch, the hit, the fielders? And so, Bill, what can you tell me about uh, so humidity in baseball? Well, uh, consider the following. Uh, air is mostly nitrogen, and nitrogen is what, everyone? Diatomic, exactly. So it has <laughs> nitrogen travels we with you. I concur. <laughs> <laughs> Nitrogen travels around with two nitrogen molecules hooked together. And two. And, you got it. I'm and with so you. by lo- I guess two in Greek is di, uh, so diatomic. Uh, deuce, uh, it means Latin, deuce, uh, deo, so it was two. All right. Okay, now so what? On a humid day, some water molecules are nudging aside some nitrogen molecules. Well, they're nudging aside some argon and xenon and all these other happy molecules, but or atoms in some cases, but um, air mo- uh, water molecules are less massive than nitrogen molecules. And most of air is nitrogen, 70% or so. So when a ball is going through the air that's humid, it's pushing aside atoms that are less massive. It, has to, it can travel faster and farther through a humid air day than a cold, dry day. And this is so not trivial. <laughs> this is so noticeable in baseball, especially and cricket, especially mm-hmm. where you're hitting the ball and it's flying at 100 miles an hour, pushing aside air molecules. If they're less massive, it goes farther. And so, and now that seems like if we follow this line of reasoning, that if you go to a mile high stadium where there's just simply less air <laughs> because right. air pressure is lower. That doubles down on this effect, presumably. Yeah, it's a true fact, not a false fact, as I whimsically remark. So you should be able to so, plot home runs per altitude of stadium, and it should go up. So Coors Field in Denver, right? Yeah. The home of the Rockies. They, I think, oh, beginning of the 21st century, introduced a humidor, the sort of thing you have for your cigars. Um, yes. No, all my cigars are in a humidor. There yes. you go. So <laughs> that then, because of the yarn inside the ball, it allows the yarn to absorb a little more moisture and therefore kind of damps it down. Is that is that, well, that be the thinking there? Wait, what well, you're saying, they put the ball in a humidor, not the stadium in a humidor. Correct. <laughs> right. That's a rather large humidor. If okay, so, so, so Bill, right, the humidity affects it, gets into everything. So I, if I have a crisp ball moving through humid air, I get it. 
But if my ball is kind of mushy because it sat in a humid environment, then what? So the ball doesn't go off the bat as strongly, as fast. It, the uh, the height okay, it would so bounce. Okay, so it's a, mitigating, it's, a, it's a mitigating factor yeah. on the humidity that would otherwise make it go farther. Yeah, yeah. So when the, the Rockies first started playing, it was just home run, home run, home run. Yeah. Long hit, long hit, long hit. But they had this innovation. They they get the balls humid, and it uh, slows them down a little bit. Why is that? Why do they want to do that? Everybody so likes that, home runs. Uh, well, the the game became uh, complicated in that you all the strategy, all the tactics that a pitcher, where infielders would stand, the batter's approach to the ball, everything was changed by the ball traveling so much farther, swinging it about as hard. Also, the pitchers had much more difficulty causing the ball to curve or change, but then they could throw it faster. So these two things. So the thing about baseball that everybody's kooky for is every pitch is a statistic. Every pitch is a datum in the great pantheon of baseball record keeping. I don't know if that's a pantheon, the great record books of record keeping. And so they Annals made adjustments, yeah, yeah. Annals. Mm -hmm. they made adjustments to make the statistics more meaningful when you're playing in Denver. And, you know, people, when, when you play I, baseball. I Otherwise, it's just a free for all. Well, the, the word free for all, it, it, it changes the t statistics for the home team. It changes the statistics statistics for the visiting team. Well, the in Yankees had all these great left-handed sluggers, and they made the right field fence 296 feet. So yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. so. How many Babe Ruth home runs dropped in at 298 feet on the so right field this, line? Okay, DJ, right. do you guys actively know that humid air the ball goes farther when you hit it? Is that an actively uh, known thing? It's not something that um, that I'm thinking from a scientific perspective, but I'd yeah. rather hit a baseball in June and July than in September and October. <laughs> that much I do know. <laughs> oh, okay. So somehow it's in the psychology of what you would yeah. – okay. It's yeah, worked its I way say, into I say, you. I always say baseball players are probably the, the smartest physicists that don't know it because, <laughs> <laughs> because we're always thinking about stuff like that, but we don't know what we're thinking about from a scientific perspective. Because and, naively uh, for you sure, think, you know, humid air is heavy and, that, and you're thinking, but Bill Nye just explained that away. Right. Yeah. It's not a matter of it, it, how it's a different it when you when you hit a ball in October and September, late September in the north, um, it, it's uncomfortable. And, you know, it doesn't feel the same way in July. And most of the places you go to in July and June, it's pretty hot. So, you know, like so I, I'd love, I used to love to come down here. Reggie Jackson, Mr. October was such a significant. It was more than just it's. It's World Series season. It's October. Yeah, <laughs> it's and it, it's the, air is, is, the, the air is 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 cold and crisp and and all that goes with the autumn. It's a it's a different game. I mean, and, and even like you know, looking from a West Coast East Coast kind of thing. You know, the even down south in Florida. I mean, uh, we would come down here for for spring training when it, from New York, and it was like, oh wow. You can just feel it. The ball's going to go further. It's going you're going to throw it a little harder. You're going to run a little faster. You just feel it. So you're you're yeah. the, you're the the um, the the uh, the unsuspecting physicist, just like yes. you said, that's great. I love that. So, so Gary, offline, you were telling us you had a question about about uh, global warming affecting yeah. us. Why don't, you, why don't you hand that to Bill? Okay, Bill. So we've says. we've seen record temperatures in Death Valley this year, something like 130 plus. Wait, I think we should build a stadium in Death Valley, which is very very high air pressure because it's very uh, it's very low elevation. And then curveballs would be amazing. Yeah, there might uh, be a problem in the field. <laughs> yeah, and also, you know, the game depends not this year, but generally on fans coming to the okay. stadium. Yeah. yeah. And, that and if it's 105 degrees, that's another drawback. Yeah. I yeah. get that. But holding yeah. aside those complications, that would you be a curveball <laughs> thrower's dream. A stadium. The ball player in the from of Death 29 Valley. Palms. 29 guys. So, uh, yeah, as the world gets warmer, the air gets warmer and less dense, and we will expect the ball to go farther. So places like your beloved Seattle. Wait, wait, wait. Two Boston, things. Wait, wait. Bill just said two runs? things. Hold on, hold on. Bill just said one thing that even means two things, right? Mm -hmm. So, Bill, as the world gets warmer, uh, warmer air is thinner. Right. There's fewer molecules per cubic meter or what have you. Okay, A. And B, if the world gets warmer, we are evaporating more 
moisture and keeping more moisture in the air. So gets more humid. Is it true that the air on in general would be more humid? Yeah. I mean, that's my certainly first cut at it. That's what I would expect. Yeah. Okay. So we have two reasons why balls would, would go out in, in, in a, in a, in a uh, global warmed earth. Mm -hmm. Baseball will have more home runs. Yeah. Yeah. And more extra base hits and also uh, higher pitch speeds. And the faster the pitcher throws it and you make contact, the farther would the ball would go. If, if you make contact. saying, let the pitcher do the work. Many of us have seen sort of strobe photos of a golf ball getting hit. And you see the golf ball collapsing and then recoiling. Uh, do you know how much a baseball... I remember when I was a kid and I unraveled a baseball. It was... I, I, it was it was that one of the happiest moments of my life. I, 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 wow! I just discovered that there's like rubber inside, and then there's a little there's like a candy thing in the center. You know, it was just this. <laughs> like Tootsie Roll, like a Tootsie Roll pop, right? Exactly. Yeah. I felt like I was the first person discovering this. Um, and uh, do you know how much a baseball deforms? Some so the ball use. compresses a surprising amount. Like imagine if you could grip a baseball and squeeze it with your index finger and middle finger so that your index and middle finger were uh, fully submerged in the surface of the ball. Oh. That's about how much it compresses. It's really uh, surprising. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and so part, so it, part of the compresses, distance is, yeah. is the ball restoring hey, to its shape. So the ball is in, is in a way propelling itself – in the aftermath of that collapse. Well, when you jump off a trampoline, is is the trampoline propelling you or is it you? Well, it's, the answer is both. Yeah. You're storing energy in the ball. In the, and the ball or in the springs of the trampoline. So yeah. how long does it take? What, what sort of timeline are we looking at here from impact, deformation, and then returning to its original shape? About a thousandth of a second. That long? There, are, yeah. Not a hundredth. Much less, I mean, way less than that. Uh, if it were a hundredth of a second, Gary, I think you would see that in their high-speed replays. Yeah. A and thousandth that, of a second is, is not catching that. Yeah. And it has to return uh, quite quickly because it won't fly, obviously, as well. Right. Uh, the act of returning off the surface of the bat, it gives it, pro propels it forward, like, like Bill said, is the impulse, which is a physics term. I think they, they've well, shown some focus? pictures of that, like of, of, of contact where, where the ball gets deformed and almost, uh, you know, envelopes itself over the bat. It's, it's wild. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's really surprising. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. sort of velocities are we talking about, DJ, for a bat? If, if, if we've got a real power hitter, what sort of speed is this bat meeting the ball? Well, let me ask that another way. If Go the ball then. leaves the bat at 105 miles an hour, mm -hmm. does that mean I hit the ball at 105 miles an hour? Uh, is my bat moving at 105? Can, can the ball no. go faster than the speed with which I swung the bat? Uh, that's, that's, yeah. a, that's a question for Bill. I Bill. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know this from a famous, wonderful science teacher demonstration. You get a basketball and a tennis ball. and uh, Oh, the double bump. The double bump. I love you it. You can, yes. So go ahead, love Neil, it. describe it to the listener. May I? No, but you started it, but I'd, I, would, I would so delight in describing this. Okay, so if and we have we've actually had to calculate this in physics class because it's the result is unbelievable. You see it and you say I don't believe it, and then you calculate it, and then the calculation shows that's what must happen. If you take a large ball and a small ball on top of it, okay, mm -hmm. so the the large ball has to be much bigger than the small ball. So it could be a bas so, basketball and like a a marble or well, a, a marble is pretty good, but you can use a, a, a baseball or you can use well, a, or a baseball. That's fine. A, a tennis bigger, ball is the traditional thing. Something much bigger than that ball. So take a basketball and a, and a, and a baseball. Sure. And so drop one by itself and it'll come up to a certain height. Drop the other by itself. It'll come up to a certain height. Take the smaller ball, hold it just above the big ball and drop them simultaneously. The other traditional thing is a little strip of double stick tape or a loop, a loop of tape, so that the ball is, as you drop it, it stays kind of stays. Uh, right. So there stays they are. As they drop, in, what happens yeah. is the bottom ball hits first, mm -hmm. recoils off the ground, goes upward, and hits the small ball, which is itself coming in 
and then doubling back off of its own recoil as well as the basketball's recoil. And it goes up nine times as high. It'll yeah, so the, the, wow. the traditional thing is a basketball and tennis ball. And so the basketball is so much more massive than the tennis ball. When its momentum is transferred to the tennis ball, it become, it changes into this, or red, it's, it is uh, manifested as a high change in speed of the tennis ball. And it's basically launched. It goes, yeah, it's it'll, cool. It, it goes 50 feet in the air. I mean, it's, it's a striking yeah. e uh, experiment that you do. Pun intended. Right, in, yeah. in beginning physics. Okay, so I like that. Excellent. Well, the baseball, you guys, is all so-called classical physics. There's no That's what I said, Newtonian physics, and you got all me mad at me for saying that. <laughs> I didn't really get mad. I just, if you're a baseball coach, I don't know how much people respond to I'm, I'm using all of fluids. this today. All of this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right, guys, we got to yeah. land this plane. Thank you, Bill Nye. Do you still go by Science Guy, or is that an occasion? Yeah, like yes, a, yes, it's trademarked, people. Don't make me come over there. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you, Gary, DJ, Neil. Thanks for having me. All here. Pleasure, and Bill. Ga Gary, always good to have you co-host. Pleasure, DJ, it was good. it's great to have you back on this. Yeah, man, it's good seeing you again. I and, hope you uh, enjoy Florida. Crazy I am. People. It's, we all it's agree. great. Crazy people. Stay live in well, DJ. Playing a lot of golf. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's very enjoyable here. <laughs> you got it. All right. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. As always, bidding you to keep looking out. <laughs>